I know that uh, Pastor Chuck has his special seat back there, so I get the bar stool instead. Good morning, everyone. Mark chapter 14, verses 1 and 2, the plot to kill Jesus. It was two days before the Passover, and the festival of unleavened bread. The chief priests and the scribes were looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and kill him. For they said, not during the festival, or there may be a riot among the people. Today is Passion Sunday, and we are now entering into Holy Week, the final days of Jesus before his death and resurrection. When we think about the word passion, we often think about romance and love. And I have to say, for the longest time, I couldn't understand the connection between passion and Holy Week. Well, for those who are just as much in the dark as I was, I'll just uh, provide a clarification that the word, the English word passion comes from the Latin passio or passum, which means to suffer. The word passio goes back further to the Latin word patai, not patai like Thai food, but patai. Uh, which is to suffer, and the Greek word, pathos, which denotes suffering and deep emotion. This is the time that we are to remember the pain and suffering that Jesus went through. As we prepare for Easter, we often think about the resurrection on Easter Sunday, a new life, Easter bunnies and lots of fun and candy. But we should also remember the beatings, the torture, and the blood shed by Jesus to wash away our sins and save us. There are some who debate whether Jesus' death or his resurrection was more important. But regardless, the suffering and crucifixion are a central part of our faith. For today's worship service, we've already started uh, a little bit differently than we have in the past for our Palm Sunday. And we're going to transition now to the Passion. And instead of offering a uh, regular sermon as we normally do, the lectionary asks us to let the Bible speak for itself. The story of Jesus, his suffering is a powerful one, and one we need to listen and reflect on, to hear the words of God telling us how much he is willing to suffer, how much he desires for us, and how much he loves us through going through all this for us. That being said, I wanted to also add, uh, we'll, we'll go through the scriptures for the um, for the Passion, starting in the Mark. Um, and I'll add a few words uh, here and there just to bring us back to our Lenten season theme of covenants. Uh, and this week in particular uh, is the covenant of blood. So that's, that's what you see on the bottom there. Okay. Um, so with that, um, let's begin with a word of prayer and pre- prepare our hearts. Lord God, open our hearts, open our souls, let us remember the time 2,000 years ago when you gave your Son for our lives. Let us hear the cries of your Son. Let us hear the joy of the love that he gave for us. And be with us now as we prepare for this very special week in our faith. Amen. Can we have the next slide, please? Okay, actually, I thought the next slide was uh, lighting the candles. We. Um, we uh, have already had our candles lit, so let me just ask them that, uh, um, can I have uh, our youth come up and we will just, as, as we reflect on this time, um, I just ask all of you to uh, focus on the candles as a symbol of uh, Jesus Christ our Lord. And uh, as, as you do that, the youth 
can I have you come up and we will take our offering from this morning to the altar. I invite you all to um, open up your Bibles as we go through this morning's worship. And uh, if you don't have a Bible, there's a, a red Bible. sat at the table, a woman came with an alabaster jar, a very costly ointment of nard, and she broke open the jar and poured the ointment on his head. But there were some there who said to one another in anger, why was the ointment wasted on in this way? For this ointment could have been sold for more than 300 denarii and the money given to the poor. And they scolded her. But Jesus said, Let her alone. Why do you trouble her? She has performed a good service for me, for you always have the poor with you, and you can show kindness to them whenever you wish. But you will not always have me. She has done what she could. She has anointed my body beforehand for, the, for its burial. Truly I tell you, wherever the good news is proclaimed in the whole world, what she has done will be told in remembrance of her. Those present at the sight of this woman's action were aghast. The perfume could have been used to help the poor and they rebuked her. Yet Jesus defends her with the message that she put him above all others. The story is a prelude to the final days of Jesus and this woman's actions symbolize the preparation for Jesus' burial. As we reflect on these, this text, I'll just point out the fact that she broke this jar and poured it onto his head. Rather than just twisting off the cap or uh, pulling out the cork and pouring a little bit out, she actually broke this, this alabaster jar. And it's a symbol that, I mean, after she, after she breaks this jar, she can't put anything back in. So it's a symbol of this all or nothing love that she had for Jesus. For Jesus, he too had an all or nothing task before him. His suffering and death were not conditional. It wasn't a matter of him saying, I will do this if you do that. There was no turning back for him. And the covenant of blood was Jesus' blood. And only by giving his life completely would our lives be made clean. As we continue worship and move through the text, we will be punctuated by this hymn, Jesus Walked This Lonesome Valley. We invite us now to turn in your faith we sing, you know, which is the little black hymn in your pews, to 2112. We we'll sing verse 1 now.
Mark chapter 14, verses 10 through 11. Judas betrayed and agrees to betray Jesus. Then Judas Iscariot, who was one of the twelve, went to the chief priests in order to betray him to them. When they heard it, they were greatly pleased and promised to give him money. So he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Do any of you recognize this face that's on the screen? His name is Basil Rathbone, and he's known for playing Sherlock Holmes. He was an old uh, movie star, TV star. Actually, I don't know if it was TV, it may have been a little too far back. But Walter Ferris and Basil Rathbone created the play Judas and performed it at the Long Acre Theater in New York City in 1929. Since he was a teenager, Rathbone was obsessed with this relationship between Jesus and Judas. The question is, how could Jesus have brought on this despicable character named Judas who would eventually betray him? The book of Matthew tells us that the price of betrayal was 30 silver coins. And you have to wonder whether 30 silver coins, whether it was worth it for this man once he betrayed Jesus to be known forever as the betrayer. Judas saw Jesus as the Messiah, not in religious terms, but in political ones. He saw him as one who could, who could or would lead the Jews uh, in revolution against the Romans. Some theologians say that it was Jesus real, or Judas's realization that Jesus was not this Messiah that led him to betray Jesus. Now, perhaps it's true that Judas uh, was torn and tormented about what to do with Jesus. But regardless of what Judas was going through, Jesus must have been tortured uh, in his own realization. Judas was not alone. There were many Israelites that looked to Jesus for this political revolutionary. And Jesus wasn't blind to this expectation. He knew what they were looking for. And so there must have been this great sense of pressure for him to conform or be what they wanted him to be. On the other hand, the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees and the scribes were all plotting against him. So there was a very fine line for him to walk. Yet Jesus had to maintain focus on the cross. He knew there was no worldly glory in the death that he was about to experience. He knew that his friends would abandon him, and yet he alone would die for the sins of the world. If you haven't done so, I invite you to keep it open for the third stanza when we sing it at the end of the service.
Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 16. Preparation of the Lord's Supper. On the first day of unleavened bread, when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, his disciples said to him, Where do you want us to go and make preparations for you to eat the Passover? So he sent two of his disciples, saying to him, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the owner of the house, The teacher asks, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He will show you a large room upstairs, furnished and ready. Make preparations for us there. So the disciples set out and went to the city and found everything as he had told them, and they prepared the Passover meal. I, I don't know how many of you have been to Jerusalem, but if you look for this place called the Upper Room, if you're lucky, because the signage is pretty bad, uh, I got lost, you will find a room, this room. Imagine yourself in this upper room at the time of Jesus. It's a big room, and at that time it probably had many people. This was Jesus' last meal with his friends and followers. Passover is usually a time that is celebrated with family, but for these men they were all away from home and away from their families. So they were each other's family. This was a time of celebration for Jesus, and it was his last opportunity to be with all of them under such jovial conditions. When we sign a covenant with someone, it is more than just a contract or an agreement. It's a relationship, a relationship that you want to be in. As Jesus looked around the room and saw these people in front of him, these were the people that he wanted to be in relationship with. He entered into this covenant, the covenant of blood, under his own free volition, under his own free will. It was these people that he cared about and loved so deeply. next section is the Passover meal. We're not going to say, we're not going to read the scripture, but we're going to act it out. So I'll play the role of Jesus and Huang An, one of the disciples. Father, I thank you for your word has become flesh. I thank you for this opportunity and privilege to be the flesh, the body. Take, eat, this is my body. Father, I thank you for you have sprinkled the blood on the Mount Sinai with your people that you are going to be with them forever. I thank you for this opportunity and privilege to be part of your act of mercy with your people and to take my blood to make the covenant with them. This is 
my blood of the covenant. Drink from it. Come, let us participate in this Passover.
tell you the truth. I will not drink it again until the day that I drink it anew in the kingdom of God. Mark chapter 14, verses 17 through 21, we're told of the betrayal. When it was evening, he came with the twelve, and when they had taken their places and were eating, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, one of you will betray me one who was eating with me. They began to be distressed and to say to him, one after another, surely it is not I. He said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the bowl with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. But woe to the one by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that one not to have been born. When we hear those words, or even perhaps when we have seen the movies about this, uh, this passage, it's easy for us to think about Jesus as condemning Judas. It is easy for us to see Jesus enraged that this man who would share the cup, share this meal, would be the one to betray him. And it is easy for us to see this, this conflict of Jesus with Judas. But Jesus knew the heart of every person in that room. And he certainly knew the heart of Judas. If Jesus loved his enemies, did he not also love Judas? After all, Jesus had accepted Judas as one of his disciples, knowing full well the path that Judas was about to take. So I wonder with this statement, whether it is really a statement of condemnation or perhaps compassion. I pity you, Judas, Jesus may have said. My heart goes out to you. What you are about to do, do quickly. As Jesus hangs on the cross, he prays for the Jews. Forgive them, for they know not what they do. And in doing so, the covenant of Jesus' blood transcends all those who betrayed him, who hated him. Rather, the promise of God's love was unconditional and is extended to all God's children. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour may pass on him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. When he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping, Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Could you not keep watch for an hour? 
Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to say to him. Returning a third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Um, when I read this passage, it kind of reminds me um, of some of the trials that we all may have gone through. Uh, some may be just expecting a tough midterm coming up, uh, worrying about it. Um, and times like this, many of us may be worrying about a conference we're having with our boss next week. Uh, and for some of us elders, it might be a doctor's appointment that's coming up and no good news is expected. I think that um, what these passages have shown us so far is that God understands our pain and understands our suffering. And though he may have lived 2,000 years ago, he is still with us today. So join me now in some silent prayers. I will, I will lead as I, I read this. And please reflect in silence and pray your own prayers um, as I pause. Let's all pray. O oh Lord, we find you in the garden. You have fallen to the ground in prayer. Your sweat falls like drips of blood. Your soul is overwhelmed with sorrow, and we remember all our sorrows. You are distressed and trouble, and we remember all our troubles. You ask for the cup to pass from you, and we remember all our despair. You seek the comfort of friends, but find them asleep. And we remember the times we too are alone. Yet your will bends to the will of the Father. You fulfill the promise, sealed by your death and revealed by your resurrection. And we remember that you are Lord. Amen. Mark chapter 14, verses 42 to 50. The betrayal and arrest of Jesus. While he was still speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. And with him there was a crowd with swords and clubs from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders. Now the betrayer had given him a sign, saying, The one I will kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. So when he came, he came up to him at once and said, Rabbi, and kissed him. Then they laid hands on him and arrested him. But the one who stood near drew his sword and struck the slave of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Then Jesus said to them, 
Have you come out with swords and clubs to arrest me as though I were abandoned? Day after day I was with you in the temple teaching, and you did not arrest me. But let the scriptures be fulfilled. All of them deserted him and fled. As we close today with the betrayal and arrest of Jesus, we look forward or we see to the future that Jesus will face a trial with the decks stacked against him. His disciples will scatter and deny him, and he will suffer the Roman scourge. And, uh, for those who don't know what scourge is, that's the torture and the, the beatings that the Romans did at the time. And eventually he would be crucified on the cross. Throughout this time, Jesus offers no resistance through the trial or his beatings. He enters death, slaughtered as a lamb being sacrificed. As Good Friday approaches, and I, I invite you all to join us uh, for our Friday, uh, Good Friday services at uh, the Presbyterian Church and here at CCOMC. I hope that you'll take time to reflect on the sacrifice of our Lord Jesus Christ. On one last note, I want to share with you a perspective from uh, Shusako Endo in his book, The Life of Jesus. He suggests that the Gospels don't record verbatim all the words of Jesus while Jesus was hanging on the cross. And he picks out uh, some of the words that Jesus said. And you'll hear these again uh, Good Friday, our Good Friday service. Eloah, Eloah, Lema, Zambachthani, or I thirst. Or Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And he shares with us that these are actually quotes from uh, the Psalms. Psalms 22 and, and 31. And so he surmises that while Jesus is on the cross, he's, Jesus is actually saying these prayers, repeating the Psalms while he is up on the cross. And while the start of the Psalms is a cry of sadness, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? The song turns more to singing praises to God with words like, I will tell of your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of congreg the congregation, I will praise you. His conclusion is that in this time of despair, this moment just before Jesus' death, that Jesus was not in despair, that he was actually declaring his absolute trust as he commends his spirit to God. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. And that's the power of the covenant of the blood in each of these passages. The covenant was given with his all. It was given intentionally. It was because of his love for us that he gave this covenant. It was given no matter who we are, and it was given not out of weakness, but out of strength. And so as we close, I, I found this, uh, this picture on the internet that I thought was very appropriate because this, in the service we, we reflect on the beatings and the sufferings and it's very easy to feel down and feel like Jesus lost. But if you look at the caption under the, um, under the picture, it says, It wasn't, it wasn't the nails that held Jesus to the cross. And above it, it says love. As we journey out into this holy week, 
I invite you to journey together this journey of Jesus' passion, suffering, journey of love. Would you stand and sing with us the last verse of Jesus' walk this long Sunday? Thank you. 